بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ولديمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشافي نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته طيبين طاهرين معصومين صادقين Our glorious prophet according to um, the program that was given to us, has said in one of the hadith that the intelligent person regards the little good that others do as being much and regards the abundance of good that he himself does as being little. This is from our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. wanted to let everyone know that um, I was very happy to be invited out here. And when I saw this subject, I thought of a story. But uh, one of the things that I felt was very, very important that the organizers of this group did was, for every one of the sessions, they had given a, be a brief um, synopsis of what was going on. <clears throat> that way you would know what it was that the subject was about before you went there. And it's um, beautiful what they put here. So. If you just bear with me for about a minute and a half, and I'm going to just restate what they stated in the program. <clears throat> it says, we often fall into the trap of being complacent about our status before Allah. Psh, I'm so perfect. I attend dual kamel. I don't drink or gossip. I pick up my plate at the masjid. <laughs> <laughs> When in reality, we have a long way to go. Most Muslims are happy with the status quo. But what inspires the outstanding believers, but what is it that inspires the outstanding believers to go above and beyond? This discussion would explain why true activists sacrifice sweat, blood, and tears to act in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever put that together, you did a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah, as I begin, <laughs> I like to say that we as believers in Islam have been blessed to have faith, a faith where we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and the whole of mankind perfect examples to follow. Uh, when I first took my shahada 20 years ago, I was very interested in uh, comparative religion. And because of my family background, many people, once I became a Muslim, they thought that I made the wrong decision by leaving the church. The person who felt like I made the worst decision in life was my mother. So my mother, being the good mother that she is and being the good Christian mother she is, she had this understanding in Christianity that if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. So my mother, she said, I don't want my son to go to hell. So she solicited a family friend. And that family friend came over to speak to me about the decision that I made. When he came uh, to talk to me about that decision, he bought a book with him entitled Islam Revealed, an Arab Christian perspective of Islam by a man by the name of Anish Sharosh. When I got the book, I didn't read the book. I didn't look at the book. He just gave me the book and I held it because the reality was Anisha Roche had two debates with our brother Ahmed Dirat, rahmatullahi alayhi. And for those of you who know of Ahmed Dirat or have watched his work, you know he took him to task. I mean, he destroyed this guy in two separate debates. But my family friend said, read this book and you'll understand why it is that you've made the worst mistake of your life. So I took the book. And if I had known that the book was by Anisha Roche, I would have gave it back to him. But because I didn't read the book in the beginning, I didn't know what it was. So I said, let me read this book to see what it is that Anisha Roche is talking about. Maybe I can learn something about Islam that I don't already know. So I pick up this book and I'm beginning to read it. And I'm reading what it is that this brother is talking about in the debate and he's misrepresenting the events of the debate. And then he begins to quote from Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, things that were the nastiest things that you could ever hear that were ever reported about the prophet. He didn't fabricate the hadith. He actually quoted true hadith that came from these books. 
So I found myself in a situation where I was angry, but it was so compelling that this person would put these things in this book. I couldn't walk away. You've been there. You hear somebody talking bad about one of your family members or a book that you've read or something. You're angry. You want to walk away, but you just can't leave. But there was one hadith in the book that it made me so upset. I picked up the book and I threw it at the wall. And the hadith that he quoted was from either Sahih Muslim or Sahih Bukhari. It says that one of the companions of the Prophet came to the Prophet and they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, when you die, are you going to Jannah? And according to the hadith, Rasulullah said, Allahu Alam. I said, wow. Here is a man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that he is the best of all creation. We have hadith that say that the whole of this world was created from his light. Would our Rasul say anything like that? In the beginning I said, you know, he lied about it. But then I stepped back, I came back in, I picked up the book again, and I began to continue to read. Anisha Rosh used this hadith to show that he believed that Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, was superior to our prophet because Jesus Christ would never say that he didn't know and only Allah knows if he was going to Jannah. I said, okay, fine. But now I had to look at this situation from another viewpoint. With Rasulullah being masoom, with him being sinless, with him not being able, with him not committing any errors, is this a response that he would say? The answer to that question is a resounding yes. Don't shoot me. <laughs> but why is it a resounding yes? Because if Rasulullah says beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to put me into Jannah, how does he sound? Arrogant. arrogant. So would our Rasul do anything to show any type of arrogance? No. no. Because that was not in his character. He said that his main responsibility for coming here was to correct what? Our moral character. Did Rasulullah know in his heart that he would go to Jannah? Of course. Would he say it out loud? Maybe not. For that I say, Allahu Alam. Because when we look in our books of Hadith, we know that Rasulullah will be in heaven. How do we know? Does Rasulullah say, yes, Allah is going to put me in heaven? No. He tells us things that's going to be in heaven, and he tells us that he's going to be there with those things. Where's the fountain of Kautha? Who's going to be there? Prophet Muhammad. Did he have to say when these people asked him, are you going to be in heaven? Did he have to say, yes, I'll be there? No. He gave us another way to deal with it. This shows us the humility of our prophet, and this is something that we have to build towards. But this hadith also gave me something else to think about. If Rasulullah, if the hadith that he is saying is true, if Rasulullah is not comfortable with his state and whether or not he was going to Jannah or not, for those of us who are Muslims, mere mortal men who don't have the isma, how could we ever feel comfortable and think that we're perfect when it comes down to our position with Allah and thinking that we have done everything that we needed to do to be on the Surat al So with that being said, I like to say from the things that we read earlier that we as human beings are referential people. We are referential creations. The only way that we can know how something is, we have to measure it against something else. How do we measure heat? Lack of coolness. How do we measure light? The absence of darkness. How do we know if we're rich or poor? We count our possessions and look at other people's possessions, and we base it on that. How do we know if we're good people or bad people? We base it on the people that are around us, and that's a bad thing. And that is the worst of things because the people around us are not the most righteous of people. They have the ability to be righteous, but if we want to base our righteousness, how it is that we are, if we are truly doing the things that we need to do Islamically, who do we have to look towards? We have to look towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Aima from his household. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, Lakadakana lakum fi Rasulillahi Uswatun Hasana. 
which is certainly we have you have in the messenger of Allah an excellent exemplar. Not just an excellent exemplar, the best of all examples. Because in akhlaq, there's no one better than him. In charity, there's no one better than him. In being responsible for people and making the best decisions for people, there is no one better than Rasulullah and after them, the Aima from his family. So the question becomes, I know that none of you in here will say that you are on the same par, that you're equal with Rasulullah in his perfection. And I know none of you in here are foolish enough to say that you are better than Rasulullah and the Aima from his household. So the question becomes, the question becomes, how is it that we, as Muslims, how do we get to a point to where we don't get to, to where we're arrogant, to where we say that we're perfect, to where we make the statements that were made in the beginning of this um, lecture. The first thing we do is we have to become conscious of our intentions. Now, these are things that many of you have heard before, but I just want to give you a little spin on it, just a little bit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful and he's so just that he judges us on two things. He judges us on our intentions and on the actual acts. But what is it about our intentions? Are we conscious about the intentions that we make to go create any act? When we go out and do something, if we pick up that plate at the master, did we pick up this plate? Fisibilillah. If we're talking about it and we're comparing it to we picking up a plate and somebody else not picking up that plate, would our intentions be that we're picking up this plate only because we want to be seen of men? To let men know the things that we're doing. If we have to brag about everything we do, then are our intentions solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or are they for the people that are around us? So with our intentions, we must first purify our intentions. How do we purify those intentions? We purify them through ibadah and amal. Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. Imam Ali has told us that we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though we see him with the understanding that we will never see him and with the understanding that he sees and knows everything that we do. Because of this, Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, and everything he did, he had this understanding and he said to us something that we have to take on within ourselves. And he says, before I do an act, I see Allah. In the middle of me doing this act, I see Allah. And at the end of this act... I see Allah. So that means that in every instance when he's doing something, his intentions is purely for what? The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we get to that point to where we can also see this? The only way that we can do this is through ibadah and amal. That means that we begin to communicate with Allah. We begin to have a personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That personal relationships makes you look at Allah, not like he's a being that's out there somewhere that created us and left us alone, but he is someone who wants to hear from us. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets his prophet know, and he lets us know in the hadith, that tell my servants, tell my servants when they call on me, that I'm near to them. Call on me, I will answer you. So why don't we get answers from Allah? We don't call on him. The more acts of ibadah we do, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to remove the veils that cover our understanding and covers our spiritual eyes because it's only because we have these veils that we don't understand truly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches and sees and hears everything that we do. You see, when we're kids and we're around our parents, how many of you act the same way when you were in front of your parents when you weren't in front of your parents? You would run around and you would act crazy when you were somebody else, but as soon as mommy and daddy's there, you stop. At your schools, you don't act certain ways in front of your professors, in front of your deans. At your jobs, you don't act certain ways in front of your uh, supervisors. 
Why? Because you understand that the supervisor has a certain type of authority over you and that the supervisor, he can reprimand you for your bad actions. He can suspend you or he can fire you. When we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a lot more power than this person does and that we can't hide anything from Allah, then when we see that and those veils are removed, then we will begin to amend our problems ourselves. Why? Because now we're able to see that Allah sees what I, see, what I do. He sees it in the beginning, he sees it in the middle, and he sees it at the end. So this builds our taqwa. Because what is it that, that helps us to see this thing in this way? It's our taqwa. How do we build God consciousness? Again, we build God consciousness through abada and amal. I cannot stress how important it is for us to take care of business when it comes down to what we're supposed to do that Allah gives us. The doctor gave a very good hadith from Imam Jafar As-Sadiq earlier. <laughs> he says, for those who take their prayer lightly, that our shafa'a will not be given to you. Tell my Shia that for those who take the salah lightly, that, my shifa, that our shafa'a will not be for them. We have another hadith that says that if your salah is not accepted, then your other acts of worship are not accepted. But salah is just one thing. What about Amr bil Ma'aruf wa Nahi anil Munka? What about Tawala and Tabara? How important is Tawala and Tabara? For those who were in my classes earlier, I said something. Association brings forth the simulation. If you're around people who have no love and respect for the Prophet and Aima, what do you think is going to happen to you eventually? You're going to fall right into their traps because you're not protecting yourself from those bad things. But when we build our taqwa, we build this relationship with Allah, and one thing that we do when we build this relationship with Allah, we begin to do dua. How many of you actually do dua after you finish your prayer when you're by yourself? You go in, you do your two rakats, you do your three rakats, you do your four rakats. After then, you might do the tesbih, but as far as dua is concerned, we get up, we walk away. But the dua is the most important part of our communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because it's direct. We don't have to go through anybody to get to Allah. And we could do this dua anywhere. Walking down the street, we do the dua. In our cars, we do the dua. Before we go to bed, we do the dua. Why? Because we're talking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find through the Quran, when those prophets talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah gave them answers. Now, Allah isn't going to speak to us like he spoke to the prophets, but if we go back to the Quran, we find this, where he gives it to us. But as Muslims, when we're going on this road and we're doing well for ourselves, sometimes we go through peaks and valleys. And when you get to the valleys, we rely on old faithful. What is old faithful? We say, oh, I missed my prayer today, but Allah is our Rahman and our Rahim. He'll forgive me for missing my prayer today. You know who's waiting for you to say that? The shaitan. He's patient. He's waiting for you to say that. You know why? Because he's hoping that you would abandon the abada that brought you to that point where you are. But what we find is from our aima, what is it that keep us spiritually in check for this one? Imam Jaffa Asadik alayhi salatu wa salam said, that there is not a believer who does not exist between fear and hope. He said that the believer should have so much hope in Allah that he not, does not fall in despair and that he fears Allah so much that he would not dare to create any type of sin. How is this possible? Because of what Imam Ali والسلام, said earlier, that he sees Allah before, in the middle and after. Why? Because of that taqwa that he's built up in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what we find is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that none, none, uh, none disregards the plan of Allah except for people who have gone astray. 
This plan of Allah, as it's been translated by Imam Rida, he says this plan is actually the punishment of Allah. He says for those people who sit back and they begin to say, you know, okay, well, Allah said he's punishing me. It's not going to be much. Be careful of that. Be very, very careful of that. If any of you want to know if you're on the Surah al Musaqim or you're going astray, all you have to do is read all of the verses that pertain to Bani Israel. And if you're doing the things they did, you're on the wrong path. <laughs> because the Bani Israel, what did they say? They said, oh, we sinned, we did all these bad things, but my punishment would only last for what? A little while. If they were punished at all. This is arrogance. Would our prophet be arrogant? <laughs> No, but this is the arrogance of Bani Israel. But many of us fall into the same place. And if we do that, we fall into a sin, a greater sin called Al Amno Min Makrilah, which is to disregard the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a major sin, like major sin number five from the book of um, Dasta Gave Shirazi. So, with this, what do we begin to understand? Number one, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us his mercy, but he has given us a check to, understand, to let us know that with his mercy, in order for him to be just, if you didn't do what's right, there has to be a punishment for it. So this checks us spiritually. And for those of us who really think that we really have it made, that really think that we're perfect because we go to the Dua Kamel, I really ask you, go back, read Dua Kamel, study Dua Kamel, one of the problems that many of, our, that many of our communities are having is that we have listened to Dua Kamel our whole lives. And there are many of us who hadn't taken the time to go in and to read the Dua Kamel in the language that we understand. And when we don't read this Dua in the language that we understand, there are so many jewels. There are so many good things that are there that we have missed out on. And we understand that Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, he recited this dua. And when did he recite it? He didn't recite it like we do, standing up or sitting down. He would recite this dua when he was in sujood. He would recite the whole of the dua when he was in sujood. How did it come to us? Because Kumel was praying next to him one day and he heard him reciting something. And he asked him what was he reciting and he told him and he taught it to him. But in this dual Kamel, and I'm not going to take a long time in this because the time had actually gone over. In that dual Kamel, there's so many blessed parts in that dua. One of, the, one of my favorite parts in that dua is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not, pardon me, when Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam is relating to Kamel, we know that the dua is from uh, Kither, but our Imam is relating to Kamel, he says, How many of an ugly act? Have you changed into a good deed for me? He's speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many ugly acts have I committed that you have made good deeds for me? How many bad deeds have I done that you've covered and not allow anyone to know about me? How many good deeds that I'm not worthy of have been spread about that you allowed to do that? How many of these things happen? This is dua kumel. We're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing his mercy through this dua. And we ourselves, we sit back and we say all these great things that I've done. We think that we're perfect. But if our intentions are not right, are we perfect? If we think bad thoughts about people, are we perfect? Even in this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he lets us, uh, Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, he lets us know something else about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only does he make it easy for us to do the things that we need to do, but he has turned a blind ear, a deaf ear to the angels because he says, how many acts have you, ha have you not allowed the noble scribes to write while you yourself was the witness behind them? This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we find ourselves becoming arrogant, when we find ourselves thinking that we're perfect, when we find ourselves comparing us to somebody else, then we need to turn back to our imams and to our rasul. And the thing that makes those people that are activists continue to work hard with their blood, sweat, and tears is the fact that they know that the scale that they have to reach, 
the mantle that they have to reach is perfection. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us those who are masoom. And we know that as human beings, that even if we stop doing something for a while, that we still have the ability to fall back into those sins. One of the things that the older brothers taught me when I first became a Muslim, I said, Alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim. The older brother said, Inshallah, you die as a Muslim. So with that being said, we have to understand that when it comes to being activists, and this whole retreat was about activism, activism is all about you and your relationship with Allah. The more you build your relationship with Allah, the easier it is for you to go out and tell people about Allah. The more you understand this product, the more you know about this product, the more you study this product, the more confidence you have in this product. So when it comes time when people say bad things about Islam, you stand up with authority and you say, I am a Muslim and this is not what Islam is all about. The greatest work that an activist can do in Islam is actually da'wah. That is to spread the message of Islam to those who do not know. Me personally, I am tired of having our da'wah being sponsored by CNN and Fox and all these other people who have no good interest for us. But because they are making an effort to tell the people what they believe Islam is, then what other choice do the people have but to accept what it is that they're telling them about Islam? I close with a verse from Rasulullah. In the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him to say, Say, I call to the way of my Lord, me and those who are with me, and we are not of the polytheists. If we are the followers of Rasulullah, this is a sunnah that was given to us of Rasulullah, but it came from who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this is Quran. If we say that we're believers in Allah and we're not calling towards the way of Allah with this type of activism, then we've missed the boat. Inshallah, I'd like to close with the following dua. Ya Allah, make us of those who are not arrogant. Ya Allah, make us of those who are going to be soldiers for Imam Sahib Asri Wa Zaman. Ya Allah, make us of those who will be the ones that's out front to prepare the way for the quick return of Sahib Asri Wa Zaman. Ya Allah, make us uh, successful in our activism and bless those who created this event. We ask all of this, Bihaqi Muhammad and Wa Ali Muhammad. And we close the speech with... Uh, with a surah to Fatiha, but before that, the Lord of the Salawat. Oh.